a discourse delivered by Elder Joshua Grant, Jr. at the conference. My friends, as an opportunity presents itself and I am requested by my brethren to speak to you, I cheerfully embrace the present opportunity and address you for the first time from this stand. You have been entertained during the conference with many interesting, instructive, and edifying discourses, and it would seem superfluous in men to attempt to add very much to the remarks already made by many of my senior brethren, who are much more competent than myself to lay before you the principles of eternal truth. But having been called upon to address you, I embrace the present opportunity with cheerfulness, and feel happy for the privilege that I now enjoy of communicating as well as being communicated unto, after so long an absence from your midst. Since I last stood among the saints of the Most High God in this place, I have journeyed in different parts of the United States to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. My voice has been heard in many towns and villages far from here, who had not before been made acquainted with the principles of salvation, as made known in these last days. And my labors have not been futile, for the Lord has blessed my humble endeavors to propagate the gospel of truth, and I have been an humble instrument in His hands, in bringing some few to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus, who are now rejoicing in the liberty wherewith Christ has made them free. Although I have traveled in different parts, my labors, however, have been principally confined to the southern, where, for the last three years, in company with my brother, Elder J. M. Grant, I have traveled and raised up a church consisting of upwards of two hundred members. In looking at the large concourse of people that now present themselves before me in this conference, my mind is carried involuntarily to other scenes, and I am reminded of the situation of this church, when in its weakness and infancy, which, contrasted with its present numbers, respectability, and influence was but a drop in the bucket, and bring with renewed force to my mind the great work in which we are engaged, and that, as God hath, has hitherto put forth his hand to defend his people in the day of adversity, that, as they have, in their weakness, baffled all the attempts of wicked and designing men aided by the powers of darkness to overturn and destroy them, that, as they have hitherto been aided by the arm of omnipotence and sustained by the power of Israel's king, that if they still continue humble and faithful, the same power, the same intelligence, the same care, will yet sustain his own people, bring to pass all the things spoken of by the prophets, gather his elect from the four winds, and crown the saints with glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. Without any further remarks by way of preliminaries, allow me a short time to call your attention to the following text, which you will find contained in Matthew 24:14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto the nations, and then shall the end come. These are the words of our blessed Lord, and he spake of his disciples in answer to certain questions which were propounded by them in relation to his coming and the end of the world. After entering into many particulars pertaining to the events that should transpire in and about Jerusalem, speaking of the calamities that should destroy that city and bring destruction upon the Jews, he goes on to describe the signs that should precede the coming of the Son of Man and the end of the world. Among other signs that are referred to by him, it is that contained in the words of our text, which is one of the greatest and most important. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In all the dispensations of the Lord, and in all his dealings with the children of men, he has pursued one uniform, undeviating course. Though the earth by revolutions may have changed, and man has been wavering and fluctuating, God has declared concerning himself, I am the Lord, and I change not. And wherever we can trace the dealings of God with man, we shall find that they have been unchangeable. He has always taught men by revelation, in regard to the gospel. It is a principle that has always existed in all ages where God has had a pure church. And if the children of Israel were placed under a schoolmaster and the law was added, it was because of transgression and not because of the changeableness of God. For he has always pursued one uniform course, to edify, instruct, and give the world a knowledge of his law, and in unfolding the principles of truth to the human family, he never instructed them at random, nor suffered them to go according to their notions, or at the bidding of men. They never wage a warfare at their own charge, but they were endued with power from on high. Wisdom and intelligence was given through the great source of the priesthood, which God has given to regulate the affairs of his kingdom, and thus being allowed to qualify by the wisdom and intelligence that God has imparted. They were prepared to unfold the gospel of Jesus Christ to a fallen world, 
If this has been God's way of dealing with the children of men, it naturally follows that it will continue to be. And if the preachers of the gospel in primitive days were thus called and empowered, it follows as a natural consequence that it will continue to be, and that, as God is immutable and unchangeable, whenever he calls men to any age of the world, he will qualify and inspire them in the same manner. And if they are thus taught, whether in this age, in ages that are past, or that are yet to come, there will be a uniformity of doctrine and ordinances. They will teach the same things. There have been many who have professed to be called of God, but their doctrines have been diverse, and their ordinances conflicting. The reason of this difference is that they had not been taught of God, nor inspired from on high, but their leading has been mere, merely scholastic, and their wisdom of the science of men. Thus situated, is, it is impossible that they should teach correct principles, for man is finite and fallible, and God is infinite and infallible, and it is impossible for the people of this or any other age to comprehend the Creator without being taught of Him. The disjointed manner in which sectarianism has placed the gospel renders it extremely ludicrous, one having taken on part, and another part. Now the ordinances, gifts, and powers of the gospel are not one, but many. Yet being many, they are not divided but the one gospel, proceeding from the same spirit. One, two, nor three items do not compose the gospel any more than if we were to take two or three leaves out of a book and call it a book. As it takes all the leaves to make a book perfect, so it requires all the ordinances, gifts, blessings, powers, and priesthood of the gospel to make it complete. It may, with propriety, be compared to a chain, which, if any link is broken, it destroys the force of the whole. So, in like manner, if one principle of the gospel is destroyed, it renders the whole imperfect. The Saviour told his disciples to teach all things whatsoever he had commanded them. Hence this gospel, in all its parts, must be preached to every nation before the Messiah will come, and men must be inspired to prepare them for the accomplishment of so great a work. According to the statement of the Universal Geography, there are 3,026 different languages. It must be obvious to every reflecting mind that it is absolutely necessary for the gifts and powers of the gospel to be restored before the gospel can be preached to all of those nations and tongues. And if it is not, the Messiah cannot come. For the preaching of the gospel to all nations is one of the great signs that must take place preparatory to the coming of the Son of Man. This brings to our minds forcibly the necessity of the gift of tongues in order that the gospel may be preached unto all nations in their own tongue. For the best linguist in the world cannot understand more than twenty different languages or tongues, and if they do not and cannot learn them, it is absolutely necessary that ministers of the gospel should be inspired with the gift of tongues, as the apostles were on the day of Pentecost, to prepare them for this arduous undertaking. Many, because they possess not those gifts, and not having the honesty to acknowledge the reason for this deficiency, tell us that we have no more need of them. But if they can accomplish this work without the power of God, the fullness of the gospel, and the gift of tongues, they will accomplish more than has been done by the so-called preachers of the gospel for the last seventeen hundred years. Mr. John Wesley informs us, in his fourteenth sermon, that the reason why these blessings were lost was because Christians had turned heathens again and had nothing left but the dead form without the power, and we presume that if others would open their eyes, they would see the like discrepancies. I would remark, in regard to the gospel being a witness unto all nations, that there is a striking coincidence between this and the testimony of our Saviour concerning his disciples. Ye are my witnesses, as also is the Holy Ghost that bears witness of me. They were the acknowledged, authorized heralds of salvation. To them was given the keys, that they might unlock the kingdom unto others, preach salvation themselves, and ordain others to this authority. They were the only persons who could properly be called the witnesses of the Saviour in that day. They had been with our Saviour and seen his miracles. They had witnessed his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. They had felt the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. They had seen him transfigured on the mount and ascended into heaven and after his death and resurrection they saw and conversed with him forty days, and afterwards saw him ascend into heaven in a cloud. He afterwards appeared unto them, and became their benefactor, instructor, and friend. Thus situated and endued with his power, they were certainly of all men upon the face of the earth most com competent to be his witnesses. The Holy Ghost was also another witness of him, 
and wherever the gospel was preached and believed, that the Holy Spirit bore witness, enlightened, and comforted, and wherever the pure gospel of Jesus Christ is preached by proper authority and believed in and obeyed by this world, it will be productive of the same results. If this was the kind of testimony that existed in those days, it is absolutely necessary that a principle of the same kind should now exist, that men should be endowed with the same power, possessed the same priesthood, administer in the same ordinances, and preach the same things. Then the Spirit of God will bear testimony to the word preached. It will not come in word only, but in power, in demonstration of the Spirit, and in much assurance.